yes, we have a volume, but not not so much that they did 20 years ago, but it's much more pay attention to the intensity control and do the right amount of training to the right time. And, and I think that is the, uh, the secret. And I think one, that is one of the things that has made us improve more than some of the other athletes and most of the other athletes from other countries. The Triathlon Show 223. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Adil Tveiten, who is the head coach of the Norwegian Triathlon Federation and uh, the personal coach of uh, all of the great Norwegian triathletes that, if you follow uh, either the short course draft legal circuit or even the long course 7.3 racing or recent years, you have seen taking multiple great sculpts, po- podiums and titles, including, for example, Christian Blumenfeld winning the WTS World Triathlon Series Grand Final in Lausanne in 2019, and then a week later, Gustav Eden winning the 7.3 three world championships in nice i was lucky enough to be invited uh, by Adil to come and watch the norwegian team and some other athletes that are participating in their camp in rio mayor just an hour uh, outside of lisbon so i got to spend the day with them and see what they were doing uh, chat with Adil about uh, all things coaching and training and uh, we took some time to sit down in his hotel room and uh, record this interview and uh, it was uh, really gracious enough to share basically everything that they're doing very openly and uh, that's something that i really appreciate uh, about him that openness and willingness to share so uh, this is a real doozy of an interview i'm i think that you will really like it and we'll get into it right after thanking our sponsors precision hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com If you have been struggling in hot and long races, one of the factors that you might want to look into is your hydration. Uh, For example, are you consuming enough fluid in the first place, but also are you consuming enough electrolytes? Because if you get electrolyte and in particular sodium depleted, that is something that can cause a decrease in performance. Precision Hydration have a free hydration test that you can take online on their website and that will give you an estimate for how much sodium you lose in your sweat and how much you should be replacing in racing. So go and check that out and if you want to try their electrolyte products you can use the promo code thattriathlonshow15 to get 15% off your order. And big thanks to Roka that you can find on roka.com forward slash TTS. Roka are the world-leading manufacturers of wetsuits, tri-suits, swimskins, goggles, and high-performance eyewear. And you can get 20% off your order. And it's uh, getting to that time of year when the racing season is getting closer. So if you are looking for upgrades in the wetsuit or tri-suit department, for example, uh, those are probably my two favorite Roka products, I have to say. The, uh, the tri-suit and the wetsuit, the Maverick X, those both have the arm sub technology. So I feel super mobile and uh, flexible when i'm swimming they don't aren't restrictive at all and uh, the buoyancy in the wetsuit is great and uh, it just feels very smooth and fast Uh, so check out whatever you're looking for to tackle your new racing season your fast at your fastest self and get 20 percent off your order with the promo code that you'll get on roca.com forward slash tts all right, so with that, let's get into the interview with Arild. I'll just mention that we did this live in his hotel room on training camp. Uh, there were some knocks on the door, some things to be taken care of, a lot of messages coming uh, into Arild's phone and things like that. We were passing the microphone back and forth between us. Basically, bear with us if there are any uh, situations where the audio isn't uh, top-notch, but uh, I think that uh, it should be definitely good enough. Uh, so, uh, And we'll try to do our best in editing to make it uh, a pleasurable listening experience but keep that in mind it was a live recording uh, with uh, the pros and cons that come with uh, that territory but let's get into the interview here with Arild Tveiten 
So today we have a live recording from Rio Maior in Portugal. And my guest is uh, Adil Twyten from the Norwegian Triathlon Federation. Welcome to the show, Adil. Thank you. And welcome to Rio Maior. Thank you. It's been, uh, I'm very grateful for you hosting, hosting us, myself and uh, Sofia, my girlfriend. And it's been fun to follow what you've been doing with a swim in the morning and then uh, followed by a, a bike session. And uh, there's some running and some duathlon to go. So uh, a lot of things going on today. And uh, maybe we can start there. What is your general training looking like at this time of year? We're in the 1st of February and it's an Olympic year. So what, what is it that we're doing now? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, first is very early in the year. And uh, this is actually also the only sea level training camp we have during the year. And the only camp where we have all the national team members, including the juniors. So it will be a very different training program based off we have different athletes with different background and age and everything. But um, in general, I have to say that our training is... <laughs> We don't make any big changes because we are going into the Olympic year. No, it's more like doing what we know works well for us before and not try to find out something new or do something extraordinary. So it's just, of course, normal good training as the way we are used to in Norway. Um, as I said, this is early in the year for us. And it's an escape from the winter. Uh, most athletes have been home the last, uh, back in Norway, five, six weeks with cold weather, a lot of indoor training, especially on the bike. So, so now it's time to get out, to get, get into the kilometers, a lot of, of low in intensity, of course, and uh, slowly build up the, the training. But, uh, I have to say that slowly build up the training because when we're going into a camp, all the athletes should be well prepared and already had done at least up to two months of uh, training back home in Norway. So the fitness level should be good. But uh, it, it is still that we're doing more, all the training outdoor, a lot of um, low intensity. But of course, we, we do the intervals that we always do, mostly uh, around threshold. And we are starting to build up a little bit higher intensity, especially for some of the athletes who are going to... Um, to race in Abu Dhabi in uh, around five weeks, I think. So, 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 so it's suddenly that the season is starting. So, we are actually started well, and uh, yeah, we are happy with the training right now. Uh, does the fitness level fluctuate a lot uh, throughout the year, like from the off season and heading into the early part of uh, of the year, and now getting closer to the start of the World Triathlon Series? Or do you think that your athletes that do you like to keep them, um, like a, except for maybe a short break, fairly fit throughout and uh, and always pretty close to uh, to the fitness that they will be racing at as well? I have to say that uh, most athletes are really close to a racing level fitness all year round. But of course, after the season, uh, we take a break, um, take it easier. But uh, we see that the, the athletes on, on the team, now, they want to, to train and want to maybe do some other things. But it's nothing that they're taking one month off or something. Uh, in our program, we have two weeks where they have no structured training which means that some of them do almost no training some of them training a little bit every day or doing a little bit different things so and, and then we start quite early uh, compared to many others where, where, where we started an altitude camp that we already do, does that in october and uh, and that means we have a uh, but there we, we build it up very slowly, we don't stress, we do uh, some of the hikings in the mountains, but slowly build up the volume and also the intensity. And actually this year for some of our athletes, it was quite a long season as normally because after the WTS races, you have the Super League and for instance for Christian Blumenfeld and Gustav Eden, we had the um, Super League in Jersey. 
and then we were able to take a little bit easier, but then we went to altitude camp, and then it down from altitude to do the suplex in Malta, and then back up to altitude again. So there were actually almost the whole October there was training full time, uh, and after that we also know that uh, Christian Brunfeld did a race to Bahrain seventeen point three, and of course he prepared for that, but then he it he, he take a little break after that again. But it, it is more like try to do things a little bit different and do things that I normally don't do and but uh, yeah but uh, we have a, probably a little bit more active regime than the others so w- when we are coming into this training camp uh, the athletes are on the second training camp of the season they are uh, quite fit and um, I can turn them into to racing yeah within a short time uh, actually, some of them were racing later today in the Portuguese Duathlon Championship, but uh, but that's uh, just for fun. So that sounds like then you're not uh, somebody who is worried about uh, peaking early in the year, and that's going to ruin your chances at the Olympics in in Tokyo. You you keep close to race fitness year long, and and then you can basically uh, just get that final those final few percentage points uh, for any race basically at at any time you want is that correct yeah, almost like that uh, of course it would take some time and to be really fit and special but uh, the fitness level we are we, we plan to have in the olympics should of course be the highest and the best of the year uh, but 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 we think that uh, having quite good overall fitness all year round is good and yeah, the breaks the Atlas take is okay. Uh, it's very independent, but our Atlas actually think that the first week at the altitude camp, uh, nice weather, easy cycling, trekking in the mountains is actually kind of a vacation and mental relax relaxation. So for them, it's actually better doing that or staying at the beach for one week and do nothing. So, but but that also means that the fitness level is quite okay during the year. But as as I say, that um, we build up the year. We do it a little bit different than last year. But we have two goals. The one is we want to be race ready for all the races we do, and we want to be at the best in, at the Olympics. And that is probably quite similar as most of the WTS athletes does. So with the 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 type the type of training that you are doing throughout the year, you mentioned already that you do a lot of threshold work and, uh, uh, of course, the high volume of low intensity training. Uh, but is that something that is fairly constant, or does that fluctuate depending on when the races come? Will you do any changes there, or will it look similar throughout the year? Uh, it will have a little bit variation from from earlier. Um, of course, we think that to keep up the volume and the intensity down is very good to to to, to try to keep at a good intense uh, good level during the season, and then we put a lot of emphasis on the threshold threshold session, which we do all year around. But of course, when we're going closer to to the races, we go higher intensity. Um, and more race pace, we have to max kind of session. Uh, but it is also some changes we do that we always have spending some time in the lab uh, to do testing, uh, lecture testing, we have to max testing both in all disciplines. And we are paying much more attention to do individualization of the training based on what we see the need to work on during uh, uh, based on the test. So for some athletes, that actually means that we are turning into a little bit a regime where we're doing m- more intensity training than we did maybe last year. So so, so that that is one of the changes in in total. It is not many percent of the training that is changed, but it is a little bit changed and, and a little bit different. And I also have to say that uh, last year, go uh, we ha- we were preparing for the uh, test event in Tokyo, and 
we had a clear plan that we want to do the preparation as good as possible and have quite good experience out of that and which means that when coming into the Olympic year we, we should be quite confident on what we should be doing and yes doing the same thing and not try to now work on things that what we should do for the Olympic because we are quite certain that what we did up to the test event was good but to be good at the test event we have some quite uh, extreme training at the, our first um, heat uh, camp in uh, Thailand in February where we did some extensive testing and we actually tested out something that was quite tough on the body and we, we learned something that doesn't work and we found out something that did work and we that we bring into the preparation and the pre-camp for the test event but when we do the same again this year of course we don't need to do the testing because we are quite confident what works and what don't work so uh, so we we will for sure be more competitive in the first part of the season and uh, except for, uh, than we were last year because as I said that last year some of the preparation in the winter was on the tougher side and not everything was on the short term very positive impact on, on the Atlas but on the long term the impact was absolutely good uh, at the end of the season I have to say that our Atlas performed at its best and that was the plan for the whole season so so we, we will learn from that of course and take the best of that and uh, accept that well, as I said earlier to be competitive of uh, for the whole season so one of the changes that we talked about earlier as well that uh, that you mentioned that you made some changes with more intensity is uh, that uh, perhaps you're doing more of that in swimming in particular uh, and can you discuss perhaps uh, why that is what is the reason that uh, that swimming is where you are focusing a bit more intensity now yeah okay uh, in many ways you should say that it should not come to a surprise but uh, we've been working on a swim for, for many years and uh, based on the test we did and actually the first time we were able to measure the measure of the VO2 max in swimming we we saw that all the athletes had a lot of could benefit or improve their VO2 max in swimming and we saw that um, their efficiency on high intensity was not as good as we hoped it would be of course when you see <laughs> Uh, what we have done in many of the races, especially in the first part of the season, that was not a surprise. But, but, but based on, of course, we saw in the test, but also in the races, we, we did some changes in our training and specifically on in the swim training, we're doing more, much more intensity. Uh, and, um, but, but, uh, of course, yes, that is a change. And maybe that is more like many others do. But it is also like, to benefit most of it, I also think you need to have a good volume work at the bottom. So, so, so the work we had done during the years in swimming has is, is been really good. And it was just some small changes we knew we needed to do in some of the intensity stuff that make it much better. And uh, the thing you mentioned there with uh, the testing and uh, doing a little bit too much, can you go into into that? Like, how did the testing impact the training that you did? Uh, and uh, what is it that you learned that was perhaps too much in the short term? Uh, okay, um, it is um, that was mainly uh, on the heat camp we had in Thailand, uh, where we. Uh, okay, uh, it, it was not that we did. It was something we wanted to test out, and some of the things we actually did, we we did uh, two Olympic distance uh, races uh, in training, where we was using core temperature pills, and uh, we did that in quite extensive high intensity training program, and then uh, to see how the body reacted on, on, on the heat, and that gave us a lot of answer. Uh, and some of the answers was that some of the things you cannot do in the heat. We we had the feeling that some of it was too extreme, but we 
we also wanted to test it out to, to see. But I, I have to say that uh, when we look at the history that, for instance, doing two Olympic uh, distance races in training in a th- three uh, a weeks training block was too much also when you're taking into account all the other training but that also gave us really valuable data of the core temperature and how the core temperatures are changing affecting on the intensity and the temperature uh, in, in the air and that is uh, that gave us knowledge that was quite important to working toward the, the testament. So, so, so it, it, it was not like we were doing some crazy things in training or some wrong things in training. It, it was a little bit that it was something we felt we need to know more about. And we knew that the effect on short term could be that uh, the body was too tired, especially going to the first races, let's say Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, but uh, as I say, that uh, that was uh, something. The way we see it, that was something we need to know, not have a strong suspicion that it was like that. So, so we gave us some very clear yes and no answers, and all the things that didn't work, the no things that of course we we don't need to do anymore. That we had tested it out and we see that that would not work. But then we also see some other things that we have not seen if we haven't done it that will hopefully give us a benefit going into olympics so if we uh, discuss the heat adaptation that you will do and uh, heat acclimatization uh, what uh, what have you learned what, what do you think is required to be able to race well in the heat and humidity of tokyo how are you working with camps for example in in the heat maybe are you using heat chambers and also when you are at let's say heat training camps how does that impact your how you think about volume and intensity do you adjust that for the heat and yeah, uh, yeah go into that a little bit yeah Okay, I have to say that some of the details and some things that we think we have found out is something I cannot share here. But um, in general, actually, if you go into the ITU webpage, I actually published a paper yesterday about uh, some heat acclimatization and the importance of that and also how to train in the heat. And that is, for most people really good advice that you, you need to care pay attention to the intensity and the overall volume because the training load or the the, the absolute load on the body to be at a, at a at a heat camp is quite high so we actually need to adapt that into your training so you cannot do so much training as you normally do no yeah uh, we, as, so we cannot do so much training as we normally do in the heat. Uh, we need to pay really close attention to the intensity. And I think that everyone is coming from Europe and coming up to a place where it's very hot. You see that um, uh, the RPE, the heart rate and the power output, it's, it doesn't match to what you are normally used to. So what should you pay attention to? So, okay, so then in the first day, let's say we are using the RPN and the heart rate to keep it low enough. Uh, and then you, of course, see that uh, the power output is much lower than it was normally. Uh, and I also know that some people don't take that so much into account. And when they're going on training, they just try to follow the power output that I normally do in training at home. And and that is a really, really, really big difference. So for us, the first day, in, keep the intensity low and the power and pace, they just need to what they need to be, to be low. And I, I think that, and we saw that also with some of our athletes, even if they're really, really experienced, they have a tendency to go a little too, too hard in intensity. Uh, on the first day at the heat, when it comes to a place where it's hot. Um, but, but that is something that is quite common knowledge. And then you can have, of course, something to prepare yourself for that. You can use a heat chamber before you're going to the heat. 
Um, it's a lot of small things you can do, and it's a lot of protocols available on the internet. You can see what can make it uh, transition to a heat plate quite easy. Uh, but uh, so, so so for us, it, it, it's about using some of the the common uh, knowledge that's available for everyone and and then dig a little bit into more into that and see if it's something more we can do and how we can balance the training load in total because in total we need to go down in training volume so the 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 heat camp is not the place where you have the highest volume you can have race specific training and before the, the olympics and also when we are going to thailand now, before the Abu Dhabi race, we, of course, need to do some race-specific training, but we need to balance that in, in another way than you do when you are in Europe. For instance, when you are in Fort Romeu in the summertime, it's 10 to 15 degrees. You can do have a quite tough race per session, but you cannot do the, exactly the same session when it's 35 degrees and 90% humidity. So, so that is... Um, some of the basic thing uh, we also see that uh, you need to pay a lot of extra t- attention to the, the n- nutrition most people have a problem with uh, getting enough calories in in the heat because you don't want to eat so much and uh, in also of course uh, uh, the sweat loss you you sweat a lot in the heat and you, you and just to know how much you, you sweat rate is per hour is very important and crucial to to balance your training and also how much you should drink during training and you will need to learn you actually need to learn to drink more than you do usually if you don't learn that you will be too much dehydrated during the training which again affect the the outcome of the training and of course if you do the same in the race you probably have pro- trouble with finish the race so there's a lot of small things that uh, we are paying a lot of attention to and uh, most of them are quite basic knowledge about uh, heat training actually so one of the interesting uh, per- perhaps less basic details is about the the fuel metabolism in heat so uh, there is some evidence that we use more carbohydrate when training in the heat compared to moderate temperatures do you uh, do you modify the nutrition uh, based on when you're at heat uh, at heat camps because of that to take in more carbohydrate in general or is that something that you do more intuitively uh I have to say that we do it more on a regular basis. Um, all, all our best athletes having all their own nutri- nutritionists from the Olympic Federation who are working on them with on individual basis. And it's very often based on getting in more carbs, and especially in the heat. When we are in the heat, uh, for instance, we will have that nutritionist with us the first week. So we get into the rhythm to get the right food, the right amount of food, um, enough calories, enough calories from carbs. So we really pay attention to this and we actually have our own person with us to make that be perfect. And also that person is making individual plans for all the Olympic athletes in uh, how they should eat and drink during training session and racing in the heat. And and that is very well calculated uh, down to the little details, so how much cars per hour, how much fluid they should have, and it's individually based. And, uh, and, and we have done the work for all our Olympic athletes. So this is actually one of the questions I had uh, further down our list, but since we're talking about it now, uh, I'll uh, continue on this topic. Uh, what are your views on uh, uh, just uh, nutrition, diet, and uh, also weight and body composition? Uh, that's uh, something that uh, has been discussed a lot in triathlon, of course, especially short course, where uh, lighter body weight can make a big difference on the run, which is yeah. critical, but at the same time, you can definitely take it too far. So how do you view this oh uh in general i have to say that um in norwegian we are 
in one way quite relaxed about the nutrition. Um, we are not the way that we are force some athletes into a specific weight. Um, we don't have that regime that is not allowed. But as I said, mentioned earlier, we have a nutritionist who is working really closely with the athletes. So they, they are eating well and healthy. And I have to say for all athletes, uh, it is almost the question of getting in enough calories. Uh, it's very, very seldom that the same nutritionists are talking about a controlled weight loss for an athlete. It's mostly to get in enough calories to to be at the optimum uh, race weight. And I think the high performance sport, especially in endurance sport, it is uh, most athletes will actually have trouble keep up the weight. Uh, but of course, mm, we we know it's. Uh, I, I will not say what is exact weight you should weight to be at the best at the uh, Olympic uh, race or in an Ironman. But if you have a body comp composition where you have too much muscle or too fat, of course you need to work on that and. It is a limit, but uh, I, I will not say that in you need to weigh so many kilo because that is could be totally wrong because everybody is very different. And if I go into this, is what we do, as I said, that we have a nutritionist working with the athletes, and she is also, for instance, doing a DEXA measurement to see the percentage of the of the muscle mass compared to fat and everything. And, and then you actually can see if it's anything you can do with the athletes. And for all athletes, it's more like try to keep the weight and get enough calories. And um, because if you come to a point where the only way to lose weight is to lose um, muscle and power, that, then you are going to a path that, I think it could be very dangerous because it's at some place you can cross the the line where you're losing too much power. Maybe you can be a, a stronger runner, but I, I, I don't think you will be the best athlete if you are too light and have too little muscle. But, but you still see that um, it, it is quite individual. So, so I will be very careful, but, but but say anything specific. But um, as I said, if you see the triathletes, uh, the best male athletes are some are quite little and light, one meter seventy and maybe sixty kilo. And then you have uh, athletes like Jan Froden, who is uh, he's still light, but he's more than one ninety. So it's, uh, you have different body types, and also in the WTS races. The guy who win the races, you had Christian Blumenfeld, who you all know is in many ways a quite big guy. Uh, Marcel Luis is also still quite muscular. Maria Mula is is quite thin, but they are still at the, the same uh, level, more or less, you can say. And I, I, I don't think that... Uh, I, I think they are at the weight that where they perform at the maximum. And I think if some of them try to gain an extra advantage but by losing some kilo of weight i am not sure it will be an advantage that i think it will work against them so when they're working with a nutritionist uh some uh, general guidelines for endurance athletes at a high level would be to perhaps try to get in two grams of protein per kilogram body weight and uh, let's say six to ten grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight uh, do you know if they have those sorts of guidelines they're trying to get get to those levels and and are those general levels true for your athletes or is it even more due to the amount of training that uh, that you're doing uh, we may be a little bit more higher in in the carbohydrate rates but uh, in general i have to say that the advice we get is normal nutritional advice to be healthy athlete it, it is not that any exceptional thing but because of the high training load um, we, we normally uh, put a little bit more attention on uh, good carbs carbs uh, in Norway so uh, maybe a little bit more than you said but um, 
but but we are still quite average we we don't give any special strange advice we follow most of the advices that uh, most nutrition in in all world are um, saying is but not any special diet or fat diet or ketone diet or anything like that is normal healthy n- nutrition with some extra attention to get of course healthy fat enough proteins and a right amount of carbs that for most athletes should need, need to be a little bit higher than most people who don't train so much so going back to another topic and this is something we talked a lot about uh, on our last interview it's uh, the intensity control that you have uh, for because we have a lot of new listeners uh, can you just revisit that topic a bit and talk about how you do that and uh, yeah control the intensity of the athletes in training and why you do it the way you do it Okay, um, here maybe it could come a quite a long answer. Uh, what, what, I, I will go back to the beginning when we started with our project. We tried to make good athletes in in, in triathlon in Norway. We we have no history in triathlon, and we have at, for sure no result. So when we started uh, our project, we we need to find a way to how should we develop the athletes in. A, healthy long-term way and one of the thing we very we found out that of course we need to <laughs> very simple quote is that you need to train more and better than our competitors uh, and, and that is of course true but more is necessarily not more it need to be also better and then it come into if you should train at a quite high volume training load, the, which the Norwegian maybe are <laughs> known to, you need to pay attention to the intensity. And if you are not working on the intensity and try to be at the right intensity, you have no chance in health to to be at your best. Uh, but uh, I also want to bring in something new because, yes, we have a quite high volume based training model but uh, I actually read an article yesterday in uh, the German Trimag magazine talking about the old fashioned triathlon way of training and the new more scientific approach I I have to say that um, some of the top Ironman athletes in the 19s were training a lot more than we ever do Uh, they were talking about 40-45 hours of training So, so we are much more into paying yes we have a volume but not not so much that they did 20 years ago but it's much more pay attention to the intensity control and do the right amount of training to the right time and and i think that is the uh, the secret and i think one that is one of the things that has made us improve more than some of the others at least and most of the other at least from other countries so so it, it is um we we pay attention to intensity so when we are going on a, a, a easy ride or run it's it's no point of running sp- or dr- uh, bike very hard or lactate level should be at least below one it's not one 1.6 1.7 or have a target of running of 345 minimum per kilometer it just need to be easy and uh, then of course all the intensity stuff you do it also need to be according to the plan uh, so we use uh, all the instrument we can for measuring intensity like uh, lactate and also heart rate and power and then we, we pay a lot of attention to train at the right end intensity and, and that we see that for instance when we are here on training camp um, uh, yes the volume is quite high but it's not uh, incredible high i know other athletes uh, on the WT circuit doing the same uh, but we maybe have a little bit more intervals during one week maybe up to seven or this week i think we will have at least eight hard session and if you should combine that with 35 hours of training you need to balance 
what is easy enough and what is high intensity or what is the right intensity. And, and we learn our athletes to train according to the plan on that okay so maybe you can maybe go do some specific on some of these topics but in general we pay a lot of attention to the intensity and we see many athletes um, especially we have athletes coming training with us have a tendency to go too hard on both the easy session and on the interval session and the first week uh, that seemed to respond well and everything is going well but then we see it in the second and third week of training they are not able to keep up and then they need to shorten the intervals and maybe they need to take an extra resting day and a lot of small things and adjustment they need to do because they didn't pay attention to the thing that we think is important so when the camp is over it could end up that the, the best Norwegian have been having a training load that actually is maybe 15% higher and they have five or six more interval session than the other ones because they pay attention to the small details in from the beginning. And in the end, that is some of the small things that make a difference. And I think that uh, the advice of going easy enough on easy days is something that most listeners hopefully by now will be very familiar with. But uh, perhaps the thing that you do more differently than many others is the control in the intense sessions. And we just uh, saw that in uh, the bike sessions that you did this morning and uh, we'll see it again in the run session. So perhaps you can use those as an example. So the bike session was six times uh, six minutes uh, up a hill and then coasting down. And uh, you took some lactate samples to to check that they were going at the right intensity, and and that intensity was um, threshold. You didn't want to go them yeah. higher than that. Can uh, can you explain why that is? Why why do you think that threshold is a good a good level to go at and and not any higher? Okay, um, I know that's a different view on that one. Uh, for us to develop the threshold, especially in the the bike and the run, is is about develop the highest power output or pace you can keep at a time with a still have an aerobic impact and as as higher that is is easier to build up the top end speed on top on that uh, it, it also come come down to a little bit about um, the the glycogen storage let's say you are a really fast runner and but your threshold uh, pace uh, is 18 km per hour and uh, some of our best athletes are 19.5 and they are going to do the same race and if uh, the race is a triathlon and is racing hard on the swim and the bike it's really really possible that if you have a threshold of uh, 18.5 uh, which is more than one one and a half km per hour less than we have uh, then you have trouble keeping up the same pace. You can, of course, go more anaerobically, but then you start using so much of the glycogen, you probably is depleted before you start to run, and you probably bonk and end up running slower. So, so for us uh, to build up the uh, the threshold to to find the high, train up the highest possible point where where we still work aerobic is really really important for us. Uh, of course, we know that triathlon and and especially sprint triathlon but also olympic distance triathlon you have a lot of impacts which is anaerobic but for us it's more like you better aerobic capacity you have you better ability you have to recover from these anaerobic efforts but of course on the top of that you often need to prepare for the kind of racing you're doing but but we see that the way we train, we see that we are performing at a high level. We see that it's very easy for some of our athletes to transform to doing a 70.3 races. I think we have the beginning world champion on 17.3, so it seems that that is working. But that is also the person who are fighting in the top in the, the Super League who is really, really short and intense racing. So we see that for, for our athletes and how we see it, the way to build up the training is very good to be build up the capacity. So, so the anaerobic threshold, L2, we call it, is for us really important 
but of course you you need to mix it with other things and uh, for instance we also have the many call it different things the lt1 the aerobic threshold or um, fat max point or whatever the ability to burn fat at a high level of intensity is also important and, and uh, so so that is some of the two key intensity zones we are training within and then the third one is the vo2 max but uh, out of these three i would say that uh, the anaerobic threshold is the most important but you you cannot do it only one and forget the others and one of the things we are still try to improve is to based on the test we do with athletes when we determine this point to in more detail individualize their training based on if do you need to work more on the LT1 or LT2 or VO2 max and 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 how should we balance it and uh, should we pay more attention to we have to max or race based training uh, in running compared to cycling and so on so so it's of course very individually and that is one of the things that we pay much more attention to to make it really individual based on what the athletes need as i say in general yes everyone should have a high altitude and you higher altitude you have you better possibility you have to perform at the at the triathlon race even it's a olympic or sprint or 70.3 or armor race but then you have some difference after that if you're going to do an armor uh, you need to do some of course a lot of other different training than if you're going to do a sprint race but in the end i think that uh, tra- anaerobic threshold training is something that is really crucial for us and we pay a lot of attention to that and if you do it right and do the right intensity because it is a tendency that many do it a little bit too hard and then you are maybe in the mix of nothing else you are going a little bit anaerobic you build up like that but you are not like you are working and develop your ventral threshold or we are too max because that intensity is too low for that so so then you get don't get so much out of it, but you're able to to be at the right intensity. And there we use like that. At the, the highest level, we use mostly like that. So for instance, on this specific session, which was not a very long session, but we did six times six minutes. Um, uh, Gustav Eden did eight times six minutes. And, and that compared to test, um, the elected values from that session should be it is a little bit uh, individually, but uh, let's say l- less than three for all of them, and maybe 2.5 to 3. And if some of them were actually a little bit low in the beginning, and that means I need to increase the power output a little bit. And so one, and not many, but one was a little bit too high, so I need to, to go step down a little bit. So, 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 so that is some of the thing we are doing. And at that level, I think... Um, uh, the lactate measurement is is the best best and most accurate. And uh, those numbers of uh, LT two being between two and three somewhere for most of your athletes are is something that um, is quite interesting to hear, given that four millimoles has been taken as a standard estimate for where LT two falls for many athletes, and we discussed that a little bit and uh, whether it's due to the uh, insane fitness level of your athletes or the testing protocol that you do and perhaps it's a little bit of both but um, as it uh, pertains to the the testing protocol that you do you do some things a bit differently than standard protocols so can you go into how you actually test and assess for those thresholds and zones yeah yes um when we started we found out that we want to develop the kind of a standard uh, like that uh uh, uh, build up test, uh, ramp up test. Uh, so, what we have done is um, we say we say that to have good values because you 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 want to have a nice fine curve in, in a graph. You need to have some measurement that low enough. It should be uh, below LT one, uh, and you should at least have one or two above LT two. And you more measurement point you have. 
the better the curve will be and it's better to do good analysis to determine the threshold points. Um, and we also found out that if the steps are too short, um, it could still be a quite a lot of accumulation uh, during a step within three, four minutes. So, so many using four minutes, which we definitely think is too short. Uh, in Norway, it's quite common to use five, but we still think that this five is a little bit too short. So we ended up with a protocol where, where we do uh, eight times six minutes, sometimes seven, sometimes nine, but we try to plan the workload that so it's eight times six minutes. Um, and after that, we have a VO2 max uh, part also to measure the VO2 max. But if you just, just take the leg that uh, on the bike, uh, we are working, have uh, each step, we increase the power output with 5%. So it's not constant 25 watt or something, it's 5%. Uh, on the run, we um, uh, you, use, uh, of course, the treadmill, and then we have uh, increased uh, the pace with one kilometer per hour. Is each step so quite typical for our atlas is to be in for, let's say in, in running they've been at around 14k per hour and end up at least at 21 uh, yeah so that is the the, the main protocol um, and uh, but we also do a um, a short VLMAX uh, test in the beginning uh, just to see how the leg that is rising at a short effort of sprints. Um, and, and we use that for some analyze. But the, the main thing is the, 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 the standard leg that, uh, not the standard, but our standard leg that uh, protocol. So eight times six minutes. Can also say that when we do it in swimming, we do eight times 500 meters. So it's a quite long test. And, and, and you are coming to, a, you said that. that why the test results are what they are. Uh, we think that for a top athletes, you need to have more steps and uh, the length of the step should be long enough. But that also means that the total length of the test is very long. And most age groupers will probably have better doing a shorter protocol because it's probably too long. But based on that, we, we can see that... Um, uh, the rise of the curve uh, and, and lactate production is uh, it gave us good data to find the individual threshold point both for the aerobic uh, fat, fat max LT1 or LT2 um, based on that and for us we think that 4 millimole especially for top athletes is too high our athletes working at 4 millimole will be very anaerobic and have trouble with that uh, but of course, that is of course one of the big difference b between an athlete who training ever at twenty five to thirty hours a week every week during a year compared to an age group of doing five to ten, maybe fifteen hours a week, and they do it, they do it maybe thirty hours a week, uh, thirty weeks a year, and then a lot of the time then spending doing other things. So I'm not sure that you can use the protocols for for everyone, and uh, the tests could probably be maybe not so accurate but for us it gives very detailed and a good accurate result yeah and i think the important uh, interesting point here is to hear the reasoning behind this and uh, and it also explains uh, some some of the decisions you you do in in training it it all makes sense but it's also very contextual so it's not necess necessarily the best for for everybody uh, since you measure measure VLA max in that test, do you have any benchmarks? Because your athletes, some of them are jumping back and forth between everything from Super League to 70.3 distance. Mm. Uh, have you seen that at certain levels of VLA max, they perform well at the long distance versus the short distance? What's your take on that? Yeah. Um, uh, we have uh, not so many uh, tests. The, on, on VLA Max, but, but, but we see a tendency on that. And we have, um, uh, yeah, we know the uh, VLA Max uh, for our athletes, and we have seen the difference uh, during the, the year. 
And we also tried to pay a little bit more attention to that. Uh, but some of the things that we have seen that it's um, very individually that, uh, for instance, uh, okay, um, the Velomax for our athletes when they are, for instance, like they are racing the world championship in Nice, they were much higher than they were the, it was before the Bahrain race. But that was because before the world championship in Nice, um, all, all that, all we had two athletes racing there and we were number one and four. They were, you had been training for the test event and then the grand final in Lausanne. And as a bonus of that, they took the, the world championship. That was a race. It was no way they can do specific training for that race, except a few sessions after the grand final. But, you know, you have one week between the races. You cannot uh, turn your body into something totally different. So so, so the, uh, the Vela Max was, of course... Uh, not of course, but it was a little bit higher in general. And that is good and bad. It's both positive and negative things about that. It was very good for the way we raced in both Tokyo and Lausanne. But for the Nice race, that actually means that we needed to pay a little bit extra attention to the nutrition. Because one of the things with the higher VLR max is also you have a, you're using more glycogen during the race so so you, so if you should not get empty you you need to pay extra attention to nutrition but but that worked out well but when we did um, the training for the Bahrain where we had two atlas racing um you see we saw that um, that built down the, the Vela max for both athlete but it was also but then we saw there was a very big difference how the Vela Max change after the race. So with one atlas, we, we see that we need longer time to uh, know we want a little bit higher Vela Max because the next race we are doing is a short instance race. We wish a lot of aerobic stuff. We need to be a lot of acceleration. So so for one atlas, we saw that the, the Vela Max was really, really, really low. And uh, we, now we are working on him to to build up that. But for the other who also racing Bahrain, that was just one week of resting and it was back to quite normal again. So we see now it's very individual based on, on athletes to athletes. And of course, it's depending on the training you do. And, and But that is in many ways quite new knowledge and a lot of coaches or, or also athletes don't, have started to dig into that. And this is quite new for us too. And, and um, we don't know everything. Uh, our sports scientist is probably one of the, the guys who's leading uh, some of the research on that. And he, he has the, the highest knowledge. But, but for us, it's still a little bit new. And, and we're getting some data and we see some observations and we're starting to pay a little bit more attention to it in the training. So, yeah, I think it's very interesting, but it's still a little bit new topic for, for, for many uh, uh, coaches working out there. And uh, on a different topic with uh, what you mentioned about the test protocol that you do, not necessarily being the best for age groupers, uh, the training that you do, of course, is not something that is attainable for age groupers either <laughs> with the volume that you're doing. Um, so... Would you, for the average age grouper, well, would you still just scale down the training that you do to do the amount of volume that they can do and do the same type of intensity that you're doing, still having a focus on low intensity training as well? Or would you structure it differently for age groupers with perhaps more intensity or would the intensity be higher in any way? Uh, it, it depends a little bit of the age grouper, uh, of the weekly volume they have. But in general, I pay a lot of emphasis on still on working on the, the the anaerobic threshold, even if you are pro or an age grouper. But then you come to the low intensity workout. It is sure that if you, your average volume is 10 hours per week, you, you probably don't need the lowest uh, intensity. Uh, so, so, so I would say in general that um, normal age grouper, you you can do a lot of the easy stuff at a little bit higher intensity, but you still, as I see it, you should still be fresh to do 
the intervals you needed are the good enough quality, the threshold. But but it, it is um, no. no uh, I think it's not a big problem, but. Uh, the biggest problem I see with age group is that um, the training, I, I will know how to say that, they have a, sometimes a quite busy uh, working life and and sometimes they don't have the time to do all the easy stuff. So they ended up doing all the tough intervals, just uh, training session that the coach had planned for them during the last three days of the week and think they are ready to go for the next week. And I think that you still need to do some of the easy works, and um, but it could be a little bit higher intensity. And for instance, if you're training for an Ironman, I think that most of the time that you 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 long session could be up to Ironman pace. Uh, but if you want to train a lot, you also need some of the easy session. Uh, and but and there, I also have something that's. Uh, quite important for me to say and this is not so much about the science but it is so much about the mentality as a, as an age group and I see myself when I getting older that um, many of the age group they're having the work life maybe it's quite busy they have the family family obligation and they have the training and everything need to maximize all the time to get most of it. And I think that many age group or people who like to train that sometimes you should just shut down everything and go out for train, relax and do what mentally is best for you. Don't think about intensity, if it's long or hard or whatever. For me, going on a really long, easy run or bike ride is the best thing I can do. I don't think about the intensity, that it should be hard or at that point. And I think to be too structured all the time, it could be too much. If you run on top athletes, of course, you do it in your training. But if you see the top top athletes, when they are... Um, well, if you see the top athletes when they are not... Um, uh, training, they do nothing. They are very lazy. But if you see an age group, they're probably stressed from work to family to training. And sometimes I think it's too much. But you never read that in the training books. They will always say that you should do this and that and the right intensity. But that, but that is a little bit off topic. But for me, that's a little bit important too. So sometimes you should be able to slow down and relax a little bit yeah i think that's uh, that's an excellent point uh, with the low intensity that you say can be a bit higher for age groupers would that be around lt1 perhaps or where do you see that being yeah i, I think to, to do a lot of the, the session around uh, lt1 would be quite fine for them and and also uh, for an age group because of the fitness level that is not so high speed, um, but there is still a pace that's higher than the slowest one. So they are, for instance, running, they probably have a kind of a decent uh, cadence and quite okay uh, technique, Able uh, at least should be able to do that. Uh, but um, And for many, it could be a problem that if you go much slower, it will be uh, too slow. But so, so, so LT1 is fine, but as I also say that if you are training for an Ironman, I will not be afraid to go up to race base of an Ironman, but okay, depending on the level, that very, could be very close to LT1. If you are very top end uh, age group, it could be a little bit higher, but uh, but normally it should be around that. So, uh, so that is a quite good advice, yes. And uh, another thing that I wanted to ask about is, uh, I heard on uh, on an interview that uh, you said uh, after Gustav won the 70.3 World Championships in Nice that you would have been very surprised if either uh, he or uh, Christian did not win that race. So obviously you knew that they had been doing some really good things in, in training and in the races before. Yeah. Uh, but my question is, what was your confidence level like about the grand final the week before on the draft legal scene? Would you have said something similar before that race? Uh, yes and no. Um, 
okay, uh, before the grand final, we, we all know that ended up that uh, Christian had a fantastic race and won. Uh, in one way, you can say that that was a surprise because he hadn't never run uh, won a uh, WTS race before. But uh, in the end, um, just two weeks uh, before the grand final, we have the Olympic test event uh, where Gustav, uh, no, sorry, Kasper was second and uh, Gustav was fourth and where Christian uh, actually didn't finish because of a bike accident. But we knew his fitness level there was so high and we knew from training that he was much better than both Gustav and Kasper. So we knew that he probably would have won the test event quite easy. Uh, it could be a little bit wrong to say it that way, but based on what I saw in training, he was the strongest of the Norwegian. But of course he had a bad crash and he was actually not able to walk for almost one week. Uh, uh, he could start to run a little bit after one week. So then we was just, was he able to get the fitness level back to race in Lausanne because the training on the run was just a matter of survival uh, or try to make him ready for the run. So that was the uncertain point. Uh, but I thought that he would be ready and I thought the other would, but I, I was not sure they would win because at that time we knew that, of course, was Marie Moulin and Vincent Louis had put a lot of, attention to the grand final they have even dropped racing the test event in tokyo to be ready for the grand final so i was not so confident there but i was very sure that we would have good result but i was not sure we would win so but uh, <laughs> i was very happy in the end when uh, christian won and he showed that he was re really strong on the run that time and uh, do you think that the draft legal racing is more competitive than uh, the long distance racing, the 7.3 C in these days, or are they fairly similar in competitiveness? I think it's fairly similar, but it is, of course, very dif different kind of racing. And uh, most people don't mix it. We see s some of the short distance athletes mix it and mix it quite well. Uh, but, but of course, the World Championship in Nice was really competitive. But so I would say that I was both at the race in Nice and uh, in the grand final. The level of uh, racing is almost the same uh, for the podiums. But um, I have to see that uh, the second best um, uh, or most athletes racing the grand final is what I think is really, really high level athletes. Uh, if you say the professional racing in the, the Nice race, maybe one third of them are really at the highest level. I think it's uh, it's spread out too much in uh, the level of uh, competition there. But of course, the best one is really, really good. And of course, when you're on the start line with uh, Alison Bromley, you know that the run will be a fast one. And uh, he has showed that he can race really well on longer distance. But uh, at that time, I actually was quite sure that both Christian and Gustav could run faster than him. So, but, and yeah, at least Gustav did, so. And uh, on the topic of jumping back and forth between uh, the distances, do you think there are things that... Uh, short distance athletes can take from the training that long distance athletes typically do and vice versa uh, because obviously it is possible as you have shown to combine the two and you found a way to do it and perhaps yeah. that might be because you're drawing into like some specific things that both of these groups do do right but yeah. what, what's your comment on that oh um in general i think okay for us uh, the way we train i think many of our athletes can do the mix between Olympic races and long distance. Uh, but I think it's very difficult to come from a long distance background to jump into short distance. And I think at the highest level, even if you are really, really best long distance and racing long distance, you, you, your swimming will is just too slow. It's not good enough. 
Uh, but of course, one of the things we can learn from long distance, because on the long distance, the, the cycling format is much more important than the uh, the cycling level, uh, fitness level f- for the best long distance Ironman uh, athletes. When cycling is very high, and that is some something we can really learn from. Uh, and many have seen that we maybe have tried to take that a little bit. Um, we have and pay a lot of attention to um, uh, to cycling. And we try to increase the level of the way we race in the ITU format races with higher intensity on the bike. And that is brought up to a level that is higher than it was just a few years ago. I think that is, uh, and that is some of the inspiration we maybe have for long distance. Uh, and so, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks. And uh, I'll finish off with uh, one question that I asked you last uh, time as well and it's uh, some advice for age groupers and uh, we actually talked about this earlier today but do you remember what you answered then and you can say the same thing but but also I would ask you to bring one new piece of advice since oh. this is second interview I can't remember actually what I said so I hope I'll, 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 uh, I'll say what you said you said that quite often age groupers they focus too much on the details and not yeah. enough on the big important things yeah. I talk a lot, so I forget what I talk. No, um, uh, yes, I, I, I've seen that uh, f- from seen from outside as an age group, but they have they are have access to everything information, and when I try to put in their own training, it's more like they pay too much attention to small details and forget the biggest work that you need to do, uh, and and that is still valid. Um, uh, uh, but uh, except for that, then uh, there's also something I said a little bit earlier. Even if you are an age grouper, you want to perform at your best. I think it's sometimes, uh, and then I maybe talk a little bit strange because I think that many age groupers are so structured in everything they do in their life, in all aspects, that they sometimes actually need to relax a little bit and and enjoy the training go out have fun and don't think too much of using the lactate the power the heart rate just go out and train and have fun i think that is something that a lot of age group can actually benefit of yeah i i would agree and i think it's as similar in many different fields it's the same for even if you're not an athlete but nutrition is a good example where some people get really motivated and want to track everything or sleep what everything you can track it doesn't mean that you always have to track it and that it's the best thing and and even if you can have a lot of benefits from tracking things and it makes sense to track some things certainly you still need to be able to be intuitive as well and in this case if we're talking about training do some intuitive training and and uh, so yeah that uh, that is good good advice uh so we'll finish off here go and have some lunch and uh, then head out for the run workout of the afternoon but uh, thank you so much uh Adil, for taking the time to do this interview and for inviting us here to watch you guys train oh you're welcome it's really nice uh, to meet you actually and uh, we are actually going to spend some more of the time together today so looking forward to that so thank you again thank you All right, so I really hope that you enjoyed that and uh, send some thoughts of gratefulness uh, to Adil for sharing all of that. I Again, I have to say, as I think I said in the interview and I said in the intro, that that willingness to share, it's, it's something that uh, I think a lot of top coaches really have. They realize that there aren't really any massive secrets. The secret is actually doing the program getting your athletes to do the program and there are different ways to skin a cat obviously and uh, and i think that's why it makes sense to not be secretive to be sharing because when we're sharing we are learning and uh, we're constantly improving we're raising the bar for each other and uh, i think Adil is a perfect example of of that but uh, that being said it's not at all common there would be a lot of federations that and coaches that that do not do it in the same way so a big thank you and kudos for that 
If you haven't listened to my previous episode uh, or interview with Adel, go and listen to that as well. It's episode 154, and I'll link to it in the episode description and in the show notes. That uh, first interview also gives a fantastic overview of the training and complements this episode very well indeed. And that about wraps it up for today. If you are looking for coaching or training plans or services or products of that nature for the upcoming triathlon season, do check out what we have to offer on scientifictriathlon.com. I think that if you're looking for anything in those categories, you will be very happy with uh, our offerings. Big thank you to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and get a free hydration plan and get 15% off your order of electrolytes with the promo code thattriathlonshow15. And big thanks to Roka that you can find on roka.com forward slash TTS. Get 20% off your order of wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, uh, sunglasses, and prescription glasses with the discount code that you'll get on that roka.com forward slash TTS landing page. TTS as in that triathlon show, so it's easy to remember. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving travel.